Okay, we'll call to order the Committee of the Whole Meeting for Tuesday, October 3rd at 7.30 p.m. First item on the agenda is roll call, please. Rosado? Here. Atac? Here. Stark? Here. Chancet? Here. Wolf? Here. Salvati? No. Here. Brown? Uh, here. O'Brien? Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Oh. Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Jeez. Okay, we have a quorum. Item two is approval of the minutes for August 1st, August 22nd, and September 12th, Committee of the Home Meetings. Any comments or questions on those? Mm -hmm. If not, could I get a motion? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Chanzik, second by... Meitzler. Meitzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion's carried. That'll go to City Council. Item three, items removed, added, or changed. Laura, do we None. have any? None? Did it make it to the agenda, the thing that we're taking off the agenda? Say that again. Yes. Okay. It's so it, we do need to take that off the agenda. Is it still on the agenda? We're discussing it even though it's withdrawn. Oh, no. We're not discussing it even though it's withdrawn. So, yeah, that would be proper to take it off yeah. the agenda. No, it's, it's, it was on the agenda. It's, it's on the agenda, so we'll just skip by it as, as, Scott as, uh, to say. yeah, it was on the agenda because there was actually a notice that went out to property owners adjacent. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to at least put it on there and then say that it was, is actually with Right. Okay. okay, so we'll go on then to item four, which is matters from the public for items that are not on the agenda. If anybody from the public would like to address us for an item that's not on the agenda. Okay, if you're here and you want to address us for an item that is on the agenda, uh, when the time is right, I'll ask you to come up to the podium and give us your name and address in order to uh, address us and um, just try to get my attention. We'll probably whatever the item is we'll have discussion here between staff and the committee first and then we'll let the audience discuss also all right next item is item number five which is the initial land use for a proposal for uh, Fox Valley Sports and Entertainment Center and <coughs> as Scott Buning our director of community development has put out a memo and just advises also that it has been withdrawn for tonight's meeting so there's no need to have that discussion Item 6, Ordinance 17-61, amending the official zoning map with the R1H single family residential high density district and planned development overlay for 1600 West Wilson Street. Kevin Stahl is the applicant and Alderman Stark. Um, so <clears throat> the attached ordinance 1761 and resolution 17110R would approve a six unit subdivision of property at 1600 West Wilson, which is where the West Side Water Tower used to be. The draft ordinance would amend the zoning map to reclassify the property from R4 <clears throat> multifamily residential medium density, which would be like townhouses, to R1H single family residential high density with a planned development overlay. The resolution would approve the preliminary plat for the proposal, and Ordinance 1761 would grant deviations under the planned development to allow the proposed configuration of lots. Both actions include conditions of approval and final plat approval would be required in conjunction with the closing of the property sale. In terms of a background, we advertised this site for sale in December of 2016 and had a land contract in 2017 contingent on zoning approval. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, plan commission on this go round of this, um, had a public hearing on September 6th. At the request of the applicant, it was continued to September 20th. Three members of the public spoke during the public hearing. Several felt that the proposed project is a better fit with the neighborhood than the previous development proposal considered and rejected. And speakers inquired about the proposed configuration and whether the applicant considered other mixes of uses or further reducing the number of units on the property. The applicant responded that he felt that a single family use was the most appropriate use and that the proposed number of units was the most viable configuration. One resident requested that a traffic study be conducted to verify whether the local streets could handle additional traffic. Staff noted that the applicant is seeking a reduction in the number of units from what is permitted. Speakers inquired about street parking and their effect on guests. On street parking is prohibited on the west side of Spuler. Independence Drive is similarly signed along the west side, and the plan provides all required parking for single family residences. Overall, Plant Commission felt that the single family residential is an appropriate use of this location. They noted that smaller homes will fill a need for starter homes in the community. Community Commissioners agreed that the proposed modification of the zoning code um, were, <clears throat> were appropriate. The commission 
agreed to include a condition to specify the Wilson Street building <coughs> elevations includes shutters and shakes shingle single siding as an enhanced elevation along this entry corridor to the community. The commission also added a condition to require additional landscape of varying heights along this elevation subject to staff review. The plan commission recommended approval of a preliminary plat of subdivision and zoning map amendment for R1H with plan development with conditions as specified in the draft ordinance by a vote of six to zero. There was one absent and the plan commission <coughs> approved design review by a vote of six to zero. And again, there was one absent. The pros <coughs> for this um, approval would permit infill development of the water tower site with single family residential units. Cons, not approving ordinance 1761 and resolution 171 would reject the proposal, proposed development, leaving the property off the tax rolls undeveloped and unsold. Budget impact, the city would collect fees for building permits and utility connections. The water utility would receive payment for the sale of the property if the council agrees to sell the property for this project. And of course, we'll get tax money for this too. And then staff impact, staff time has and would be used to complete the entitlement and permitting process. So <coughs> if this were to be passed, um, it would be going to city council for final action on October 16th. Staff does recommend and obviously so does plan commission um, recommends uh, passage of this as presented. So does anyone have any questions? Well, that was easy. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> I guess, if I could just say one thing that sure. uh, the plan commission did review the subdivision variation to request the payment of uh, Capital Park and school fees to be paid at time of permit rather than at platting because that does fall under subdivision ordinance and so it, it does require their review. Uh, it would be only the city council's action to uh, approve the request uh, to defer the uh, full payment of the uh, fire capital and capital public works fees uh, to permit uh, based on the request of the applicant rather than at final plat. Anyone have any questions, Scott? What's the average house, uh, the home value to be as far as what's the guesstimate at this point? Um, I don't believe the applicant mentioned that at the hearing, but I can uh, let him come up to the uh, microphone and answer. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Kevin Stowe. Uh, actually, that was a question of the plan commission, and the answer that I provided was that uh, the plan is for these to be in the mid two hundred thousand dollar range. About how many square feet? Uh, thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred square feet, give or take. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I just, I have a comment. I think you know one of the things that we're we're constantly talking about is affordable housing for young families or teachers or someone trying to establish themselves and number I think this is a, a really nice development in in light of what was proposed there originally it sounds like you know when we had a, a really a strong uh, opposition to the first first thing it sounds like people really are approve this um, and it just it, it seems to me to be a great addition to the city anyone else you know, I had Helen? one question that I forgot to, to ask right off the bat was we've had issues before where we permit you know smaller lots like this and say somebody buys one of these and they decide that they want to put a deck or a patio or anything behind it is that permissible on that property with the small setbacks and everything else that's on the, the lot sizes would they be able to do anything in the backyard uh, so the, the plan development does have a specification um, limiting where a patio or deck could go okay. uh, basically the, the zoning code does say basically once it's over three feet then it has to follow the principal setbacks um, if it's less than three feet or it's like a great patio uh, the ordinance would uh, limit because I, I just don't want to see us put in six houses here and then in the next you know two years after these get built have six people come in asking for variances to be able to put a patio behind their house. Uh, so if the um, minimum rear setback uh, under this plan development would be for uh, basically an allowance to go to eight feet rather than 10 feet. Um, okay. So it gives it a little more, a little bit space, of space, but it, it is a tight site. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Dave? 
Drew, if this, if this were passed and then for some reason the development didn't proceed, the building of these homes didn't proceed, is there a time limit on how long this um, amendment is good for or is it standing as is until somebody else comes in and wants to do something different? Uh, so there is a provision within the ordinance that if the sale were not to go through that basically the plan development would revert and uh, there would have to be a new proposal essentially. That's the uh, sale, but after it, if it were to sell. Yeah. Uh, if it were to sell and things were not to be followed through, there is a uh, time duration within the plan development uh, ordinance, I believe, of uh, design review is two years, and I believe the plan development ordinance is also two years. If nothing was to happen, then uh, I believe there's a mechanism that they could request additional time. Otherwise, it would basically um, revert at that point. Yeah, I thought there was something, but I wasn't sure. So thank you for clarifying that. And also, my only other comment, I mean, I'm supportive of this, but I'm, I'm glad to see that the uh, plan commission addressed the, the facade a little bit and the landscaping. I think that mm -hmm. is good. Anyone else? Anybody have any questions of the developer since he's here? Is someone waving over there without my glasses on? No? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I do have a comment. Okay, um, um, I'm very happy to see this project going forward. Uh, the experience that I had with it when I was doing building trades, uh, the superintendent of the school district at the time, and uh, Bill McGrath and I had some initial talks about doing some workforce housing there. Um, housing for young families or you know police officers teachers uh, people working in the community which I think is a, a great need for that and it's, it's beneficial to have that uh, have them living in our community where they're working rather than a neighboring community so I'm very supportive of the project okay, thank you okay the public. Oh, sorry. anybody from the public oh is anyone here from the public who'd like to speak yes. no okay okay now so would someone like to make a motion to recommend um, ordinance, <coughs> scrolling, scrolling, ordinance 17-61 amending the official zoning map for R1H single family residential high density district and plan development overlay to city council? So moved. So moved. Second. Motion by Silvati, second by Ewer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Would someone like to make a motion to City Council Resolution 17-110R, approving a preliminary plat of subdivisions for 1600 West Wilson Street, Kevin Stow, applicant? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Silvati, second by McFadden. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. You got that. All right, so because there's one no vote for each one, they both have to go on the regular agenda, as they should anyway, probably. Okay, so this will go to the next city council meeting then? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, item number eight, resolution 17-107-R, authorizing execution of a contract for Braver and Marsh, five-year management and maintenance agreement with V3 in the amount not to exceed $146,275.01. Alderman Wolf, I think this is yours. I do have this as the mayor explained to us last night this is something that we've talked about for a while um, and you would definitely like to see this go through as as far as setting up a contract for a term to, to manage the uh, marsh and maintain it I see if it has do you have a something you want to show us tonight no I was just clearing all those exhibits sorry <laughs> and uh, if we look through <clears throat> excuse me uh, the different bids and everything I think it was pretty competitive for what we're what we ended up getting on this from v3 um, compared to some of them and I think it's definitely something that we need to do because I think just as much as the the fire hazard that the mayor is really concerned about I think that there's a lot of other things that go along with that especially um, in the, the neighborhoods over there the flooding issues that they've had in the past when this does get plugged up and it does happen on a regular basis so it, it needs regular maintenance okay. anybody have any questions Dan from the, I think five six years ago and there was a lot of residents there were some meetings getting people together and, and trying to do an education campaign to get the residents to stop 
dumping yard waste and things in their backyards. Are people generally compliant or are, are people doing their part still? Um, I believe most of that was more on the, the Brayburn Marsh is owned by two entities. Um, the portion that's presented here is the west side of Randall Road, and that's what we're maintaining. I think a majority of that was on the east side in the Brayburn subdivision there. I've walked that a few times this year. The, park, or the Forest Preserve has a new manager out there. He's been very active getting things cut um, and reseeded and cleaned up a lot. So um, he's made it known. I've had email contacts. I don't know if there's as much education at out there as there was before, but I've walked it and I don't see as much either. So I think we send notices out every six years. All of the creeks in town get a letter, and I, I believe that was in the last year or two that I sent notices to all those that backed up to this waterway, the McKee Road tributary, reminding them that you should not dump adjacent to a waterway. Um, this information is also available in my office, and I believe at one time it was down here in building department. So it does get out there and circulated, and we try to publish it in neighbors as well. I recognize that the two different sides have two different maintenance plans to them, but now that that weir is open up, it seems like the two sides, um, when one side is full, the other side is full, they're, they're, they're definitely, they, they seem to work together better now. Yes. Um, it's going to take maybe a, another year or so to get back up to where the east side meets a little bit more with the west side because there was a lack of maintenance over there. But they do all work in unison. Um, we're also, the one other item that we're looking at out in the Brayburn Marsh is there's a lot of trees that are out there. And they're all those scrub trees that were dropped along the way as seeds and they shouldn't be there. So Scott Haynes and I will be walking that area along with Mahoney Creek where there's some trees that shouldn't be there um, and get a contract or proposal out later this fall to have the work done in the winter when it's a little bit more solid ground. But um, that will help give the illusion that everything is burning too because I know when we go have gone out there and burn, there's a lot of those trees and stubs that stand up and it looks as if it didn't burn, but it's really not material that can easily burn. So that's one other um, thing that we're going to be looking at is a preventative maintenance out there as well because there are, um, if you notice, if you go out to Walmart, there's some big trees at the base of that wall and we just want to prevent them from getting much larger without affecting that extremely tall wall. And any other projects on the Forest Preserve side that could be prodded along or are we generally satisfied with where we're at right now? I feel that he's come a long way and he you know the moment he stepped in it was last March he had worked at the Forest Preserve before didn't realize that all that stuff needed to be done he had a crew of 50 people out there um, clearing everything restoring removing the invasives that shouldn't have been there so I highly applaud his effort at that he took it and ran with it and he's trying to see what they can do but most of the work is being done in-house by the Forest Preserve at this time, I don't know if there may be one or two items that they may look at contracting out, but for the most part, they have enough people on staff that are capable and trained to do that work. Marty? Yeah, I just had a question on the the percentage that it was below the engineers. And it's pretty significant, 60 65%. It's $240,000 under. Is there any reason to be concerned? Because it's no, you know, it's a great I, savings, but <laughs> it isn't. It? Um, I look back at the previous five years, and I believe the range that was in the engineer's estimate was near three hundred thousand dollars. And Cap came in and totally outbid everybody, and we are at seventy-two thousand dollars for those five years. Um, and at this point, I just had an invoice on my desk last week. I think we've only used fifty-one thousand of the seventy-two for the five years. So there's preventative measures and things in there that don't always need to be utilizing the whole fund. Um, so yeah, I think this was just the right time to put this out there. Everybody's looking for their next year's work. Um, and that's part of the reason I put it out. I had talked to multiple of our contractors that do this ecological management, and they said this is a perfect time to get it out there, get a good price. Um, and I just want to make note that I know the mayor is very concerned about getting it burned. So we did have 
a burn scheduled in there every year, although our contractors have advised that it's only necessary every other year. So um, it is a special like starred item in that every other year that if the staff uh, feels that it's not necessary because there's not enough growth there that that item can be pulled. And I think V3's price was near $6,000 or so for that area to be burned. So they'll be watched and monitored. And there was a couple others that were fairly close to that too. So it wasn't that this was a complete outlier. Right. So it, it was nice to see those. I mean, these are, and these were prices that one of our consultants had put together, but now getting these, we may have to revisit some of the bids, just like what we've gotten for some other things. Some of the contractors are hungry and they're lowering their prices, which is very beneficial for us. Thank you. Elliot, you had a question? Do we, do we have any idea of the Forest Preserve side, what their schedule for burning is to be? You know what, unfortunately, I don't have that with me. I do email, his name is Ben, um, and I'm not sure if he was doing that yet this fall, but I think he was at least looking at doing some mowing and or clipping. Um, that side, there's a little bit more caution with those houses that back right up because they're really close, yeah. and that's what their concern is. So they're kind of coming up with an approach that's safe as well. Thank you. Dave, did you have a question? Uh, my, I, uh, Andrea pretty well hit it already. I saw that the controlled burn was in there every year, and I was just gonna ask why it was in there every year. It may be necessary, it may not be necessary, but I was just gonna ask about that, so. <laughs> and then the other, I guess, not question, but concern is over the years, that control burn has slipped because while well, it's too wet or well, we're busy, so what kind of control are we going to have on that with B3 to make sure it does get done? Well, part of that I will say was my oversight and looking at some of this stuff too because the original burn was like the swath along the channel, and previously before that, Noel was here and we kind of did the whole thing, and then I think it just had slipped, but now it's on the radar, it will not be missed. So, um, they will have it scheduled and hopefully we'll get it the springs a lot easier i've been told to get that burn because the fall is a much narrower window with trying to make sure everything's dry and the snow doesn't hit it so once you miss that window um you may not get that back this year i think was a very quick season for it but we got it in so hopefully it'll be in the spring okay that's all I okay anybody else yeah, I just want to offer up, uh, obviously you all know and I've been on a campaign about this for the last couple of years. Uh, I think now with Andrea's help, we've got this thing pretty well under control as far as at least understanding that we do have the potential if needed, we can burn it any time we want to any year. And I've had several opportunities to talk with the county <clears throat> leadership about this. They understand clearly where we're at and th their specific interest is the st stretch between Randall Road going east to Fabian Parkway behind uh, the new Sierra Trading Company that's going to go in where Circuit City, because we just got their building permit application today. Uh, so that'll be a new store going in there, but that's where Smash Burger and all those other people are. That the county is understanding that we do need to have a regular maintenance on that thing. And uh, I think we are coming to, uh, we're communicating about it. And I think part of the problem was there was a couple of years stretch of time there where the county was in the process of changing faces and doing a bunch of stuff. And we were having some of the same stuff here and we didn't really get as much ahead of the game as we should have with the thing. But I'm feeling very comfortable now, thanks to the leadership in the engineering department that we have got control over this thing. And hopefully we can go forward and not let it get to, you know, that thing can be really high profile in such areas as everybody, and I, I swear everybody in town must be there, in the drive through window that goes around Portillo's. I mean, everybody's obviously sitting there after they've ordered their stuff and they're waiting to get in through that long line, and they're sitting there looking at all this stuff growing there, and there's all kinds of imagination that this is poison ivy and noxious weeds and the stuff is higher than their car. And so it's something that can generate a lot of conversation because it is probably one of the most visible areas in the whole town. I mean, it's a weed patch, but that's 
because of where it sits and what's right next to it, everybody watches it. So that plus, you know, we've got responsibility to the homeowners in the Braeburn subdivision, many of whom who probably paid a premium for their lots so that they could back up to this thing. And when it first started, it was a beautiful area. It was a water feature was there. And now over the years, it's kind of grown up into this kind of thing out of control. And we've hopefully got the understanding now that we'll keep it burned down so that people can look at the water as well as people. It's a beautiful entrance coming into Batavia on Randall Road if as long as it's maintained. But if it isn't, it's a problem. And as Alan just mentioned, they, we got rid of that berm or whatever it was that was right there by Randall Road so the water can flow through there quicker. And, you know, our friends in Geneva would like to widen the pipe up so they could get more water through there quicker. But, you know, that's all been engineered so that everybody retains a certain amount of water and we don't flood anybody, hopefully. That's the idea that's behind this thing. So this thing has been kind of a work in progress since it started many years ago. And I'm comfortable now that I think we do have control over it. So my two cents for the night. And I'd like to add that from where we stopped, where Branson pretty much dead ends in the Windermere subdivision and to the Brayburn Marsh going to the NICOR gas easement to the west is, that was never part of the original permit, but it is in need of some work. And it's on our radar. Unfortunately, it's not, you know, up higher than the Area 3 storm sewer. And there's only so many funds, but it is one area that we are definitely looking at. Um, widening the channel and getting the channel back and established. We've gotten many calls over the winter um, this past year, and Scott Haynes has been out there diligently taking care of our um, beaver friends that also help dam up that area. So, you know, it makes it known that we still do need to also consider putting some funds towards improving that area as well to help the water move through that area. Okay. Would anyone care to make a motion on resolution 17-107-R? So moved. Second. Motion by Meitzler. Second by your. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Should we talk about that one? Though? Yeah, I think we should talk about that. Okay. All right. Item number nine, which is discussion for the deposition of the Tomley Building. Alderman Stark, I believe this is yours. Yep. Okay. So. As we all know, the city currently owns the Tomley Building, which is located at 2 East Wilson Street. <coughs> he purchased it in 1995 for $75,000. It was built in 1881. It's 1,472 square feet, two-story structure, and there is a 700 plus or minus, plus or minus 700 square foot floor below street level that's um, presently uninhabitable. Um, the building footprint covers approximately 20% of the parcel itself. Over time, <clears throat> the city um, has you made, and other third parties um, have made spent considerable funds to make and keep the building habitable and up to code. And most recently, the city has leased the property, serving as a downtown short-term business incubator space. And Simonetti Studios, DuPage Cabinet, and Granite, and the current tenant Vaughn Gifts have all started their businesses there. The city has actually not listed the property with a commercial real estate broker. However, through its subscription with CoStar, the property has been publicly offered for sale with a sales set price of $160,000. Um, since 2013, we've received two formal TIF redevelopment proposals for the subject property. So <clears throat> in the last one, we all remember, was the Martini Bar, and uh, the developer was trying to secure the two adjacent properties. It didn't happen. We didn't approve it. So that fell by the wayside. So recently, a newspaper article reintroduced the public to the Tomley Building and Tomley Building at a sale price of $160,000. So it wasn't, again, officially listed. It was just put out there again. Within three weeks of that article, staff received no fewer than a dozen phone inquiries from persons interested in buying the property. And staff has walked through the building with five of the would-be buyers. It should be also noted that um, Main Street Executive Director Jamie Sam and Batavia Chamber President and CEO Holly Dykeman, Deachman um, have expressed strong interest in having the city continue to use it as an incubator space. So we have some alternatives. 
that staff has put before us. They don't have any um, specific recommendation for our consideration. So that's the bottom line in terms of staff recommendation. Um, although I think the, the one statement that stood out in this is that or, or, or staff knows, uh, or no, that says municipalities are generally not in the business of acting as landlord for a private business interest and the responsibilities associated with this role can prove to consume city time and resources. So that is just part of this memo. I wanted to make sure that I didn't gloss over that. So there are five options that staff put before us. The first one is to continue for the time being utilizing the building as a business incubator space, leasing the building to start up small businesses for a period generally not to exceed one year, which is what we're doing right now. The second would be to sell the property with the condition that the buyer continues to offer the building as an incubator space at a discount rental rate. City may or may not agree to provide a subsidy, um, presumably from purchase proceeds to make actual rent, rental rate or near market rate. So in my mind, I look at that and think, well, maybe Main Street and the Chamber want to buy it. Third, sell the property with the condition that the would-be buyer presents a property redevelopment plan involving significant investment to grow the value of the property. This could be a public-private partnership um, under the State of Illinois Tax Increment Financing Authorities, which is, of course, what we tried to do the last time. Um, sell the property outright with no conditions. However, However, either alone or working with Batavia Main Street and or the Chamber, develop a long-term small business incubator program wherein the city would use the funds, proceeds from the property sale to fund such program, especially offering subsidy funds to any downtown property owner or manager willing to offer building space or, or below market rent rates to qualifying small business startups. And then five, sell the property outright with no conditions, deposit the sales proceeds from the city's general fund with no restrictions as to the future use of these funds. So there's no timeline. We can consider it. We can make a recommendation to staff as to what we should do. Um, and that is what has been brought before us tonight because as we all know, there has been a lot of interest in this building um, I know the person who's currently interested in renting it after, if it were to go to the next round of this. Um, but we have to make a decision. And, you know, the lease will be up again in January. And so, you know, it's not too early to start talking about it. Scott? So there were no less than eight people that were interested in this, correct? Um, I mean, given that, it sounds like there's some, there's some play out there where there could be some bidding for it, which is great for us in terms of, I, I mean, personally, I think we should have no role in dictating what any purchaser should do with this building, whether it's incubator space or anything like that. They're gonna buy it, provided they, they're following our ordinances and, and all that, you know, power to them. Well, let me, um, it's just so funny when you've been around long enough that you hear the arguments over and over again. The last time we discussed this, it was, this is the last piece of property downtown Batavia that's <laughs> on the riverfront. And we should make sure that we make a good, we should sell it to a good developer so that that piece of property can be used well. I'm just echoing Bill McGrath. You can hear his voice somewhere in this room. <laughs> Lucy? I, I agree with Bill McGrath. I, I would prefer option one or three and hope that, um, continue operating as an incubator, but I wonder if Main Street is so interested in keeping it, whether they could take over the property management of it. So, and it seems to me perhaps we may have offered it at a too low of price if we got so many people so quickly. I don't know that we'd want to get into a bidding war, but maybe we take it off for the market for a while and maybe put it back on at a different price in a little bit later. It's not on the market though. Well, or right. offered, yeah. we, a price was published, yeah. is the way I understand it. An old it. price. It's in CoStar um, as a property that for is sale. available for sale. At that price, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's the right price or not, and maybe we should consider it. But I would hope that whoever went in there, if we weren't using it as an incubator, did use the riverfront. Because we have enough properties downtown that have been developed that have not used the riverfront and we kick, are kicking ourselves when we walk by them and say, why wasn't that done? Dan? I, I would say if $160,000 was the right price, it would have sold by now. I don't think 
there's enough interest in, in the future of this property for someone to take it over. And I'm, I'm curious what the mayor has to say. What the people that were kicking the tires are these serious buyers? Or is something going to legitimately come from this, or would we benefit by keeping an incubator for a few more years as the commercial uh, rental market uh, or commercial uh, building market improves? Because this could be worth a lot more money in five more years. Well, the one thing I've heard from at least two or three that have been in chatting with me and maybe holding it as an incubator may, may not be a bad idea, my view, because the one thing I keep hearing from people is is that mo several people are of the opinion that this represents one of the best restaurant future restaurant sites in Batavia. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's very pretty, that stretch of the river going south from there, what's on the other banks is very, you know, receptive. And it just makes for a nice, easy area. You got a parking lot right behind it, and while there may be some private ownerships there, maybe that gets cleared out as time goes on. We've already invested another parking lot right across the street, so the, the perceptions are is is that if development is taking a place around it that precipitates the ability to somebody to go in there and do a nice restaurant. And the idea would be, I think that you would have the kitchen on the first floor, maybe the Wilson Street level and that the restaurant would all be in a new building that would be built going south from the existing structure. And when this was the Chicago Roar and Elgin Railroad Station down there, there was a building over that. That's why the building is, is not as far back from the street as all the rest of the buildings in the block, because there was this big structure where you used to go down and the, the streetcar could pull right in underneath the canopy of it and people could be out of the weather and whatever have you. So there was a, a much bigger building there at one point in time that was all tore down in about 1956 when the third rail left business. But the idea that, you know, I've had, I had a gentleman from Geneva who I think is one of the bidders on this thing tell me he thought it was one of the best sites in the Tri-Cities to make an investment for a future restaurant to put in there. And he says, the first one comes in and doesn't make it, it's all going to be about the value of the food because, or the taste of the food because the, the site's going to be dynamite. With the, the space being next to that old right away, I remember there was one developer that proposed bringing a rail car in at some point. Is that I haven't heard that recently, but the, the railway, you know, got all, the right away got altered and we put the bike trail underneath the bridge. And so that was done many years ago as part of a reenactment of realignment of that to kind of straighten this out. I guess I would share the view that I think this is a great site for a restaurant at some future time, whether it's now or five years from now. So I would hate to see us just arbitrarily sell it to somebody who I don't know what they would do with it. And that's kind of my point. I, I wouldn't want to sell it to sell it. I'd rather sell it to the right person. I'd rather have incubator space in there and sell this property is worth something. I think four or five years from now, this is going to be worth a lot of money. I mean, we've had recently, we've had very good luck with the tenants we've had in there. I mean, DuPage Countertop started there. Now the new gift shops in there, they seem to be doing okay, from what I can tell. They're, they maintain their building, they clean the windows. This place used to have a reputation 40 years ago. They had a pet store in there, and the pet store went bust in the middle of the night, and they had a fish tank in the window and the fish tank cracked open and leaked out. And so for several months, this is now this is before I was the mayor, there were all these dead fish laying in a tank in the window of that place. And that was became quite the community conversation. Alderman Brown will remember that. And so when I was first elected, one of the things that we did was make act, take actions to acquire this. And we had to do this by eminent domain just because <coughs> the ownership had just totally kind of walked away from it. And we got it relatively cheap, and so whatever we sell it for, we will have made money and we will have created new business in the downtown because, you know, Fawn and DuPage countertops are, I think, are both viable future businesses for the community. So there's some, been some very positive things happen here, but I, I just feel that this is a good opportunity for us to make sure the right thing goes in there and this restaurant does get built on the back end. How many years ago was did we take it over in eminent domain? It says in here somewhere, I think, About 1995. 19. So we've had it for 22 years. We've had three businesses in it for three years. Three successful. Three successful businesses in it for three years. We don't collect property tax on it because the city owns it. We put in a sizable investment in it to bring it up to code and to keep it up to code standards. 
I'm having a hard time seeing a business of, of good value proposition here, Marty. Yeah, I think it's I think it's served its purpose, which was at a certain period in time, the downtown needed some revitalization. I th I think it has served that purpose by showing the market that something will win there by its own, like you said, by its own very example, three successful businesses have now started and grown in there. And for the longest time, the pumpkin patch, um, Gunter's building was empty for the longest time. That is no longer the case. We're having this perception of all these empty storefronts, but there's really nothing left. And at some point, the government should not be in private business management of buildings. If it's not going to be a public use building, then it should be let the market decide what it should be. Now, we can have clearly establish some goals in there, which we already do have with historic preservation. I don't think anybody wants to see this building come down. I don't think the community wants to see it come down. So we could put those guarantees in there, while at the same time, at some point, let the little baby fly out of the nest and go on its own and let the market decide for what that building. I think it's what it should be is we're going to have a bunch of bidders on it. And I would welcome a bidding war because then that is a sound investment that the city made. Dave? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly agree, understand what the mayor is saying and, and can understand why the um, Main Street would like to see it stay as an incubator. It's a success. It's a great thing. It's, it, worked, it helps them sell downtown. I understand that. Although I can remember when we did take this over through eminent domain and, you know, we we had the discussion at that time about was it the appropriate use for taxpayers' dollars to use to buy a building? And then what are we going to do with it? So the idea at that time was, well, you know, we can't let it just sit here in disrepair. And at that time, there were holes in the roofs and pigeons in it and everything else. And so we really we had no choice but to, to take it under our control. But the discussion was to get it back on the market as soon as possible because we were going to have to stick a lot of money into it to get it up to cold, as you mentioned, and put a roof on it and, and heat it, maintain it. And all this during the meantime, then, it's not bringing in any tax dollars. Um, there has been a couple offers on it which haven't panned out. I, I would be in favor of going out for a request for a proposal and qualifications from a potential buyer and listen to what they've got to say. I don't think we ought to just put it on the market and let somebody buy it and put a go-kart shop in there or a snowmobile shop in there as there once was. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's too valuable of a piece of property to, to see just somebody just do whatever with. But I certainly think that now's the time that we should be putting it back on the market to, to see what somebody would be interested in doing. And, and going through that process, Scott, set me straight if I'm wrong, but with a request for qualification and or proposal, you know, we don't have to sell it. We don't like what somebody's offering to do we can say no it just doesn't work out you're not under any obligation to sell yeah. i'm sorry you're not under any any obligation to right. sell. no that would be my two cents i think we should see what kind of interest there is put it for sale sell it and get it back on the tax roll the, my concern as we talk through this is um to use a gambling term we're betting on the come on a lot of these things we now own the one north washington property we own all the old Larson Becker property. We own the building where the, um, uh, what's that called? Not blacksmith shop, that building. And the tin building shop. next to it, the tin shop. And all the property north of that. We own the lot next to my house. We keep betting on at some point in the future, which I've been hearing for the last six years, the property is going to get value. Developers are coming to town, and it's going to sell like crazy. We're going to make a ton of money, and we're the land. We're currently the landholders, and so for six years we've been saying that. And I am not hearing a ton of developers pounding on the door saying at any moment we're going to turn all this into the best property ever. And so when I look at the Tomley building, I say, okay, so what if someone does open a candy store there? And maybe that's not the best use. And maybe that's the temporary use. But then the economy improves in five years and gets better. And someone says, okay, let's put a restaurant in here and the candy shop is gone. I mean, you know, we, we are, yes, we are supposed to be long-term strategic thinkers, but is, are we doing ourselves any favors by 
buying up all this land and sitting on it. I don't know. So, Alan, you had a comment? Yeah, one of my comments with it is I think it's time to do it is now, not wait till something else happens within the downtown area that makes this property more viable. This is within a TIF. Yes. And how many more years are left on that TIF? Not a lot. Not much. See, that's one of my other things is if we are going to try to provide any kind of assistance or any kind of <laughs> impetus to somebody to, to put money into this or add to it to raise the value on it, there's not going to be a whole lot available from the TIF. So if that's the case, we need to do it now rather than wait. Or else there won't be much of anything that we can provide for assistance that will pay for itself. Scott? And I, I think one, one other thing to address the concern about Main Street and, and the chamber and, you know, in this incubator space. And I, I know that's, that's a nice relationship to have. I, I, it's, there's nothing stopping them from developing relationships with other property owners and, and doing that same thing with empty space that, you know, that's, that's out there. Um, and maybe Mark and Susan could write another story and we can get another eight people in, involved. <laughs> that would be great. I think it's interesting. The tea tree opened at the same time Fawn did, almost mm -hmm. within a few months. The tea tree got financial assistance from the city in terms of um, grants. Fawn got reduced space on the rent. They're, mm -hmm. they're both doing well. Mm -hmm. So can we prove out that the incubator space works better than a landlord leasing? I'm not sure we can. So that's where I look at these these businesses and say, okay, parallels here. Why am why are we landlords? So, Laura, I just wanted to mention that the um, sale of the Tomley Building and the continuation of a uh, incubator space program are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, also, the state of Illinois recently ended a micro loan program of which we were a beneficiary. Um, they notified us of the termination of that program and said you can use whatever funds you have left. Um, the funds that we have left at this time are about 26000 And so um, one of the ideas that is presented here is to sell the building, um, especially where somebody presents a redevelopment plan that offers a significant increase in the value of the building, um, and to utilize the proceeds from that sale to fund an incubator program. Um, Chris Aston and I met with both Main Street and with the Chamber of Commerce and one of the things they suggested was having a more formalized program that has an educational component to it to assist those new businesses with um, learning finance, the marketing aspect of the business um, and all of the different things that they need to know as a brand new business owner. But I do think that there's a significant value in allowing, uh, in providing some funds to um, kindle and foster new businesses like this. Um, and we have had several successes doing so. But having it in the Tomley building, one of the things that's always been a bit counterintuitive to me is that if they're a success, then they move out. And although Simonetti Studios and the Countertop Place have been successful in their second locations and are still ongoing businesses, I imagine that that's a significant, um, initially a significant setback that a new fledgling <coughs> business would have to overcome. So maybe we would want to consider an incubator program that allows the business to remain in place. And that's why we were thinking of this idea of perhaps some type of subsidy on the rent that uh, they pay in a, in a different space, but then they would take over the market rate rent at the end of that program time. I guess. Oh, sorry, Elliot. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, I think from, from my standpoint, I, I agree with the notion that I don't think the city should be landlords. Um, I think we do already have enough property on that east side of the river. You already rattled off a bunch of them. Um, you know, we keep trying to sell the land over here on the west side that, that it looks like we finally got a nice, you know, development package going towards residential. Um, this property, if, if it truly does have eight bidders out there, fantastic. Maybe it's a restaurant, maybe it's not, but either way, I think it'll become something valuable because it's going to be right there along the river in high visibility. Um, I, I like the idea of the incubator space program. I don't know exactly what that program needs to be, but I definitely like the idea of working with Main Street to help foster those new small businesses starting up in our own downtown area. So maybe that is a separate discussion that we should have. 
Dan? Part, part of what made the incubator program <coughs> excuse me, uh, work and make it so attractive was that we had this piece of property where people could go into. If we get rid of that property and we take the proceeds of the sale of that property, <coughs> we've now set a sunset on the incubator program because we will eventually spend all of those dollars. So that means we have to make a value judgment on whether or not we want to continue that program and continue to have the city fund. So we're not a landlord anymore, but we're still subsidizing businesses. So we need to make a, a, a value judgment or a philosophy judgment. Is that something we want to be in that business still? So I was, a whole different discussion mm -hmm. on this program. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It is. And I, I think, you know, that if we look at businesses, you know, a great example of a very successful business in our downtown small business got no help from the city is Beard's Guard. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are running a gangbusters business. Um, the Salvage Heart is doing very well, got no money from the city. There are a lot of companies, businesses in town that do well because they started out with a plan. And so if the, our subsidy comes in the way of helping to pay for education to get people out to Wabansi, to get them out to the small business program, that's great. But you know, being a landlord or subsidizing small businesses to come into town just seems like a, a, a stretch in terms of what government, our government should do. So I don't know I what it. the answers are. It just feels like turning this property loose and just letting whoever buy it, and then they get to make all the profit that we've been hanging on to it for all these years. That still, that hurts a little bit. Take it off the market, sell for 250. We haven't held on to every piece of property that we have. There is a speedway station that did make us quite a bit of money when we sold that piece of property. So we have to remember that. And yes, I know we're going to sit on some property for a while, but in the end, when we do sell these, they are going to bring quite a bit more money back in than what we have into them. But the, the you're right, Alan. But the idea there is to sell them and sell them, mm -hmm. not hang on, not consciously make the decision to keep it as an incubator is what we're discussing here tonight mm -hmm. you know and that's why you know I I I, I my, my vote is for getting a request for proposals out there and and see what we can see what we can drum up Susan? Um, I, Susan? no Scott would oh to sorry talk. Scott, Scott meeting Scott. out here over here no no I was <laughs> funny you're funny Alan I didn't see Scott. It's not funny, Susan. <laughs> uh, one last thing, I might, in, in regards to going out to proposal, which I think is a good idea, um, I, I'm going to start banging the drum on making sure that when we're, we, you know, our economic development or community development, economic development is we're, we're going out there and we are targeting uh, those businesses that we want. If we want, if we want the Tomley building to be a restaurant, great. Let's put a package together and sell it as a restaurant. Mm -hmm and target those restaurateurs that might want to come down here and do it. Mm -hmm. So I, it, you know, just to throw the shingle out is not good enough. Uh, if we want a restaurant in here, let's put the plan together and sell it as a restaurant. Can we get maybe an opinion or a comment from staff on this? Because I have no idea who these eight people are that have been here, been in here talking about this. And maybe Scott's got some good information here. That a dozen. He Dave, a dozen. Sure. I'm sorry? A dozen. Staff received no fewer than a dozen phone inquiries. Okay. A dozen. <clears throat> a dozen. And five would be buyers. Yeah, most of those were fielded by Chris, actually. So um, I, I had fielded a couple of them myself. And, uh, you know, people were interested in the property for the value that it was. And um, I don't think we had anybody that I contacted or that contacted me that said specifically what they were looking to do with it, but they thought it was a good investment property. For I, I had one that was specifically a restaurant. Did they all have their hands out, or were they all? Well, I think they, the ones that I talked to, at least, I think they, they saw the price of it as being you know, a good price for what they're mm -hmm. getting. I mean, you're getting the building, you're getting land. Um, sure. There's a couple parking spaces that come with it. Um, granted, it's going to be difficult to build an addition onto it because it's mostly floodplain mm -hmm. on the back area there. So you, know, you may be able to put a deck or something like that on there and elevate it. But putting an actual building addition is probably going to be challenging. I mean, that's my, you know, I guess kind of what I was looking for too was out of these dozen people or so that have been interested, it's great to have interest, but as soon as they look into it and realize that the parking lot that's behind it that they think may come with it doesn't come with it, mm -hmm. and there's a floodplain and there's everything else, so at the end of the day, how much interest is there really in it? Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure we need to, oh, oh, sorry, I thought you were waving. Um, 
I'm not sure if we need to give staff direction, if we have a clear and concise direction to give staff. Staff, You know, I, I think Dave's idea to um, send it out for a, a put together an RFP packet, you know, makes sense. It's not taking any definitive action today. Um, Thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, and that's kind of what we did a few years ago mm -hmm. right. when the teeny lounge and some others that you know came in here were interested. So we did put a RFP together, and that's how we got some of that interest at that time. So and my point um, is, that, how would it be different this time? Yeah. Well, Marcus. in that one, I think we wanted a more comprehensive proposal when we at, when we put that together. We wanted something more than just buy the building. I think we had more of a development redevelopment proposal that came with that. It wasn't just a, you know, here's here's what we'll buy it for. So you know, we can. We could put it together where we could have both options for people to put together if they want to just buy it or if they have a an idea for how they want to redevelop the property we can put it together that way as well okay. anybody else oh nick I'll, I'll add my two cents i i think our, our our revenue model is to put it on the tax rolls and get tax from it not speculate in the real estate market in the future and whatnot, even though it may look great, that's not what we do. Um, I was going to say what Scott said, that this would be a better conversation with Chris here. He's the one with his ear to the floor and knowing what, what's out there. I think we all, I mean, I would like to see it on the market, the open market, with having maybe a little direction of what we want in there. You know, I don't want... You know, we don't want something bad in there. And if we can direct it towards a, a restaurant, I would say let's put an RFP together um, and also maybe continue this conversation with Chris here and, mm -hmm. and see what's out there and what we can do to market what we want. I think we're all in consensus of what we'd like to see there. So should we wait and have a conversation with Chris before we direct staff to start the RFP process, or should we start the RFP process and then have a conversation with Chris subsequently? Talk to Chris first. No. I think I think it would make start sense the RFP that, that Laura then talks now with Chris and says that it seemed as the consensus of the committee was that we'd like to get it off off of our plate and onto someone else's with the idea that we go out for an RFP to see what somebody may be interested in doing and let Chris ponder on that a little bit and maybe even bring back something as a draft form for right. us to consider. Right. Sounds, good. Sounds good. So do you have enough direction on that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm yes. kind of seeing that maybe Lucy's the only one here that doesn't really necessarily agree with that, but no, no, I agree with the RFP. I okay. would like to make sure that we sell and, um, to someone that will create value downtown. I think we're spending a lot of time doing economic development, right? And we've held this property a long time for that purpose. So I wouldn't, I'm in favor of seeing a strong proposal from the buyer. Do you want to pick up the incubator program discussion again as well? I'd be happy to do that. Um, but again, that's a separate yeah, issue. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. What's, what, I, what I'm thinking is we need to make sure we use that riverfront. Right. So, okay. so October 17th, I'm presuming, not October 10th. <laughs> Not a I'm avoiding that date. Start writing. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go on now to item number 10, which is discussion on the education assistance program. And Laura, you're going to start us out with that? Yes. Um, the city for a number of years had an educational assistance program that um, provided reimbursement to employees who sought um uh, classes and higher education that were a complement either to their current position or one that they wish to attain in the future. And due to the economic downturn in 2008, that program was eliminated. And we'd like to make a proposal that the uh, program be reinstated. And so Wendy is here tonight to talk about that. Great. Um, as Laura had mentioned, um, prior to 2008, the, we had a, what was considered a tuition reimbursement program. It was part of a policy in our employee handbook and um, when that pro program ceased um, while there still is the day-to-day -day required training that is funded and as you see in the budget process that is has been happening in each of the departments based on specific certifications or 
or whether it's um, driving or different things that they need are required to have, that is still being funded. But specifically in what I consider an educational um, assistance program, which is allowing um, employees while they're in our employ employment to seek educational assistance at a higher level, whether it's for a degree or um, classes specifically in a, an accredited college or university that is going to be towards the type of work that they do here at the city. Um, so with that, um, when talking with department heads and um, looking at the policy and then also still working on the employee handbook, um, brought forward an educational assistance program. Um, the basics of it, it didn't change a whole lot in the basics, basics of it in the fact of the program is um, going to um, allow an employee to, I guess you'd say, apply, fill out a form and say, hey, look, I'm looking um, at either going for a degree or just taking a particular class and outlining what that looks for looks like. Um, the part that we've um, changed a bit is that, well, it would then go to the department head, and this would all happen during the budget process. And then from there, that would be administered through um, the HR department. So um, this in 2018, with talking with Peggy, we're going to set some monies aside that is going to go into my budget um, and, and based on, as you can imagine, it's going to be based on the re uh, requests. And also, going forward from year to year, it's of course totally going to be based on the financial ability for the city to pay. So there is going to be some limitations if, in a kind of unrealistic, if so, you know, we had 30 people apply, of course that could be very costly to the city. So we would manage that through the amount of funds that is, is available, which the policy clearly outlines of what's available. Um, the policy is um, reimbursing of uh, the class itself, and it is reimbursed based on um, the uh, employee's performance, so what grade they get, and they have to provide that that back to us, and it's reimbursed after the class itself. And so um, we would then, they would su supply that during the budget process, they would be reviewed, and then we would get back to all of uh, the employees and letting them know whether they're approved or not, and then that would go forward from year to year. So that's um, kind of the basics of the program, um, and wanted to kind of to make you guys aware of that, that we are hoping to. There's a, as you can imagine, there's a lot of benefits to the program, um, even just internally to the city from a succession planning perspective, um, allowing employees um, that then can receive future degrees um, w within their field of work that they're doing and then they're getting them ready for that next level, that next promotion, that supervisor level, that sometimes um, while they may have the work experience and understand the city, but they may not have that educational background when they originally came to us. So it gives us that opportunity um, for that within each department. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yes. Um, first, love the, love the idea. Um, I think that is hugely beneficial for the employees. My question is, if if it's we have a certain pool of money for this, and let's say we have 30 people that want to do something, what is that criteria for selection and for awarding that to those people? It was what? How is that done? So what that would do on a year-to-year -year basis with talking with Peggy, we would determine what funds we would be able to available and determine say we said it was twenty thousand dollars, and then based on the applications and by administering that through my office so then all of the applications come into one location so we're able to evaluate those see what the total cost is and if it is above that then we would go through and fairly say that this is what is going to be able to be approved percentage wise to be fair across all people that have applied yes. two questions um, one is this uh, strictly non-union employees it's actually all employees. all employees. Yeah, most of the contracts, and I'd have to um, just to confirm this, but I'm, I looked at them. Most of them actually have language in the fact that they say, "Hey, we get what the tuition reimbursement program said in the handbook itself." Second uh, question: Is there is there any kind of programs like with Wabanzi um, or any any state school that? we can partner with and say, hey, if we send our, we have, we're looking to provide this, can we send our, we want to send them to you and sure. can we get a discount or anything? Is there any communication? Um, currently, those? right now, I'm not aware of any, but in the past, there definitely have, especially from a public safety perspective. There have been many colleges because of federal funding and state funding. Um, for example, Benedictine College 
a few years ago provided um, law enforcement uh, degrees completely free to um, police officers and firefighters that wish to pursue their education. Um, currently, right now, there also is, which this is would almost in a way be separate from the educational assistance, um, just almost to the general public and enticing people to work in public service, is that um, the federal government has a loan forgiveness program if you put a certain amount of time in public service, you're working in a public sector entity. So there are definitely some other programs in that realm that are available to people who they come to us with their degree and unfortunately have then a lot of loan debt um, by giving us their time, then the federal government would reimburse them or, or do a loan forgiveness. Um, I love the program too. I've worked at many employers that have had it and it, it's great. Uh, one thing to consider is something that after they've received the degree and they've gotten their money that there's a requirement that they continue to work for the city for a period of time because I've seen somebody quit right after they got the money right. and yeah they're, they're actually with degree. written on the policy is we have a, a I guess you'd say a wage garnishment approval they would sign up front and then also a contract <laughs> saying that within a 12 month period if they leave within that they would have to reimburse us so absolutely we would that would all need to be signed prior to them even being approved so in the case um, where I've seen that happen unfortunately somebody leaves and and in the state of Illinois you can't necessarily like take their last paycheck they have lots of rules for that kind of stuff so yeah it kind of gets you caught yep. so we're, we're using this as a as a benefit to the employees but it's also a reason to stay employed it's a kind of a cool thing your employer does. I've heard of friends that have been in programs like this where the football got taken away at the last minute. Mm -hmm. You didn't qualify for this or, oh, that class isn't really have anything to do with what you, you know, whatever. Right. Um, I would support if 30 people wanted to do this program and we had to pony up and pay for it, if that meant that these people were going to stay employed by us for five years, that seems like an investment in an employee. That doesn't seem like a bad problem to have. Absolutely, and I and I think to as year to people. year to year, if we did have something like that, then absolutely we would say, what's the total cost to this? And we would, you know, we'd have to answer the question: Can can we truly afford to pay for it? And in what way would we be able to? And if we could, absolutely, I think overall I would prefer not to just have a cap, a hard and fast cap. And if the program's being very successful for us as well as our employees, then, and we have the funds to be able to pay for it, I think it's um, definitely something we would bring to you guys and say, hey, this is why we're asking for this type, this amount of money for that program. In, in the long run, you would agree it's better to have a position filled as opposed to an empty position that you now have to fill. Absolutely. And additionally, there's there's other a lot of positions. I think we've seen in. in recent years in some of the fields in public um, safety, in the police field specifically, a lot of our candidates are actually coming to us with undergrad degrees already, where years ago they weren't. So they were coming in and getting their degree. So if anything, they may then even be able to take advantage of this program and get uh, even a higher ed type of, a degree. Um, but then some of the other areas that I think is so beneficial is our public, um, our public works department because um, many of them come in at a young age. I mean, it's just what they do, come in as a laborer, and um, they're definitely knowledgeable and have the ability, but they just don't have the education. And so if someone was really wanting to do this, this is a fantastic program for them to be able to do that. And that's why it breaks my heart to put a cap on this. I'd, I'd rather invest in the employee. Sure. The recruiting tool too. Wendy, could, is it possible for us to be able to get a copy of what the policy is? Yes, it's is? actually posted on in the public folder. Oh. That's right. So, it is. Yes, and I didn't so. go to that. Thank you. It's sorry. not linked. And so sorry. I took the label yeah. out. Thank you. <laughs> I also wanted to point out the promotional opportunities that this affords us as an employer, mm -hmm. that um, it allows employees to grow within the organization. They can be hired at an entry level position and through both their job experience here and knowledge of our organization and the opportunities for higher education to uh, move all the way up through the ranks of the organization, which is a benefit to them and a huge benefit to us not to have to recruit high-level management positions from outside our organization. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm fully in support of this because it's investing in your staff and the return on investment on that event. Startup costs on new employees are always much greater in the long run. Absolutely. Another way to kind of maximize the benefits on this, what about those ones that already do have degrees or advanced degrees? 
working in a into the uh, professional designations portion mm -hmm. of it where those don't necessarily cost as much but still give a great mm -hmm. return where people can they already have their degrees but they're now specialized in their field mm -hmm. where you know some of those coursework is you know five hundred a thousand dollars for some of those designations that mm -hmm. really ultimately would give those employees a leg up over anyone else for minor costs. Correct, and I think that does happen in some departments, especially if we consider it a requirement for someone's job. If, for example, an engineer, if we say that an engineer needs to be a PE, then we um, we would pr pr help provide them with, as long as they pass it, help provide them with their recertification and so forth. But absolutely, this is, I'll de we, I think we can have that conversation. The other piece of it that we um, amended in this policy that wasn't included before is, as you can imagine, the look of education has changed too, and it's not a traditional, hey, I'm gonna go to a class at night. There's online programs, there's accelerated programs, and they're all accredited, not all of them, but many of them are accredited and, and worthwhile programs. So we've built some language in there to be able to review that, and as those things meet the needs of the employee as well as the city, we can approve those programs as well. Just a clarification and question. I, mean, I definitely fully support this. I've been with many companies that offer educational assistance, and it's it's fantastic. Is it not just towards degrees, though, towards certifications, towards seminars? Currently, the way that policy reads, it's for degrees as well as like particular coursework, like continuing ed. So, so it, if it's through uh, an accredited, an accredited, yeah, like if I wanted to take a particular HR class that would teach me something that. Um, that's through a college. It is true, like college, college course, but I'm not necessarily working towards a degree. Okay. But you may also be referencing um, seminars that are provided by professional organizations, and yeah. those are ordinarily handled under the training budget for each individual okay. department. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Yeah, I have one more question or comment. You know, I'm always going to support education, and I, you know, I think it's a fantastic program. Um, I'm just curious uh, of our neighbor, the neighboring towns around here. Are you aware of, of uh, whether they're doing that? Yeah, m many. Yeah, St. Charles, Geneva, many of them absolutely have programs. If anything, um, when I was talking with a few of them, they might have cut back just a little bit, but they actually didn't eliminate their programs, so their programs are still in play. Absolutely. Okay. For all, so all the more reason that we need to bring absolutely. that back. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the committee's in support of you working with Peggy to get this thrown into the budget. Absolutely. Yeah, so what we're going to do is um, we've reviewed the policy. We're going to actually get it out to the employees, um, letting, giving them a deadline because we need it for the budget process, at reintroducing the program, and finding out where the interest is into 2018, and then we'll have some idea of what we're going to, what 2018 is going to look like from a financial perspective. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. All right. Sounds good. Mary, you got anything on that? Well handled by the staff. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks Winnie. All right, item 11, project status. Or? Um, so today we talked with our uh, financial consultant, um, Kane McKenna, about revising the internal rate of return analysis on the Shodin project, One Washington Place. And uh, they asked for a number of additional documents from the developer and um, it, it's going to take them probably a longer than a week um, to analyze that information and recrunch those numbers for us but I think that everyone here is anxious to hear from the developer what the proposed changes are to that plan so um, let me know if you would still like the developer to be here on October 10th I'm sorry October 11th um, so that he can give a presentation to you so that you can understand what the changes are that he's proposing because I think we can still move forward with that knowing that we are going to have to have as an element of the decision making that revised internal rate of return analysis from our financial consultant. Well, what new numbers would Kane McKenna be evaluating if we haven't looked or seen of any proposed changes to understand what new numbers we may be talking about. Uh, well, uh, it, it's a matter of timing, really, so that if they need 10 to 14 days to produce that analysis, um, we could wait 
until after the 11th, knowing that then it might be an additional two weeks for them to perform that analysis, or we could have those two things going in conjunction with one another so that ultimately we can make the decision based on um, the, the um, they're going to be taking a look at the construction bids that the um, developer received. They're going to be looking at um, the um, redevelopment agreement. They're going to be looking at the revised uh, market analysis for rental rates, as well as the um, the changed pro forma numbers provided by the developer. But I'm I'm still confused, Laura. What new numbers? What what bids did the developer receive? Because if we're talking somewhere, whatever the number is over budget, but now we're looking at cutting the project in order to get it into budget, what new numbers would they be looking at? They would be looking at the um, per unit um, cost of construction as well as the per parking space uh, rate of construction. Is this I, myself, based I on think their new request, their new plan? Right. So I, We haven't seen it. We so seen you want to stop on the, the yeah. internal rate of return analysis? I think so, because I think, I think if the developer gets here and says, this is what I want to do with the building in order to build it for X amount of dollars and we don't like what he's saying, what's the point of evaluating it? We still haven't had a chance to say no to retail on the first floor yet because we right. haven't seen the plan. Okay. All right. Put a stop. I mean, I, maybe I don't understand what the whole thought process here is, but to me, I just don't think it seems like we got the cart in front of the horse at that point. Um, originally, I think when the project was brought to you and I wasn't here, at that time, late 2015 or early 2016, I thought that perhaps it was brought as one package, that here is what the developer is proposing and here is what our financial advisor has, our financial consultant has said in terms of the internal rate of return that the developer is expecting establishes the but-for analysis as to why the uh, tax increment financing is necessary. I don't think it was that formal, but that would have been great. <laughs> and um, so that, that's why I was moving forward. I would have hoped to have the developer here and that IRR analysis yeah. on the but same night for you. Are Dave, you making I'm a this? Little, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm a little foggy on something. I mean, from my, pers my understanding, the developer hasn't officially been in front of this group yet. They, we kind of gave them the opportunity to come in front of us and kind of do the heart attack test. Is that correct? And that hasn't happened yet. Um, I oh, offered to do that, then. and we said that we wanted to have an, a meeting with just us alone first. Right, but, and way, then... but I mean, way back before you were here, oh. they came to kind of see if we were open. Mm -hmm. But in ter terms of our normal process, they haven't come before the city council. Am I right or wrong? I mean, do I not understand it correctly? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. They haven't. They haven't come back in front of you with there, any revised plan. But there's right. a but the the land use proposal, but back in the September, original land use proposal. Oh, the, okay. But it, as far as their actual number of units, was that our official? One One yeah. Washington Street, as we all may know it, is approved and ready to go. All they need to all all we need to do is to complete our RDA between each other. Okay, and I was they, thinking. They, according, I mean, so they should it, have been under construction according to the original RDA by now, mm -hmm. but because they came into this little snafu of over budget, it slowed everything down. So now we're sitting here with pretty. I don't remember if you were here last meet the meeting when we discussed this about 30 days ago, when we said you know staff brought to us that there were six to eight million dollars over budget right i was and, here okay, okay. yeah so, now so, i okay Got so it. now you remember I'm where remember. we're at it's all clear now so laura i think went to him and said hey it sounds like the committee's not real receptive of any changes but they're willing to listen to what you've got to say but you got 30 days to say it okay i guess i was I, i'm still a little confused because at that time we hadn't fulfilled the requirements of the rda right correct they're not completely fulfilled, either one of us. So I guess that's why, maybe why I thought it wasn't completely approved yet. But anyway, um, so we want to see them complete. We want to see their ideas before that we know whether it's worth the TIF funding. We want to go through that process. We've already been through the complete TIF analysis. Yeah, but now we have to go through it again if they make any changes. 
if there is going to be changes made, it sounds like yeah. this should be reevaluated. Exactly. <laughs> this has to go back to plan commission. Um, if there's yes. changes made to the building, proposing. everything has to go back yes. to the plan commission. Yes. And the whole process, all over again. Mm -hmm. HPC as well. HPC as well. So. <laughs> Okay. So it's build it as is, get it in, get it in, you know, why you're over budget, I don't know, build it as is, absorb the cost yourself, whatever the case is, or the city, as it was explained last time, or the city come up, city come up with some additional funds. We go, we explore, let the developer explore the um, engineering changes, whatever zone it is, the tax free zone. Oh, yeah, the enterprise zone. Enter, enter, enterprise zone, all those options that were out there. But the options that were thrown out there along with those was some reconfiguration to right, the building, right, elimination right. of certain things. And I don't think that there was much support of a lot of that. So that's when we said, tell them there's not much support, but we're willing to listen, but we don't want to listen for more than 30 days. Mm -hmm. And that's time is our enemy here. So not our enemy. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the impression that uh, based on us going to a financial analysis already that there is some financial presentation that's been given to staff that we haven't seen is that correct because I'm I was under the impression that we were just sitting back waiting to see what they were coming to us with yeah so have they come with you guys with something and we're trying to work numbers and analyzing them is that what where we're at because that seems different than what we were what i was expecting is that so on tuesday of last week um we met for two and a half hours with the developer and they showed us um what their changes and the um the the financial analysis that they had of the when you compose the different the building differently with less commercial additional residential units and the fewer parking spaces, the financial analysis of how it comes up, up to what it's going to cost to build a building that looks like that. Um, following that, on Thursday, staff met internally to discuss what we were shown. And from that meeting, we determined that we would not be able to make a recommendation to city council about what those proposed changes were until we saw a revised financial analysis. However, it's important that that information be presented to you. And so that all of that information, in fact, will be public information that is going to be attached to the agenda item when, when the developer is going to come here to make the presentation. So they haven't identified if the gap is closed or if the gap is closing yet because we're not even really there yet. the gap the funding gap is it gotten, right has it gotten smaller yes has it gotten acceptably smaller and, and so that's what we can't answer so <laughs> acceptably smaller would be if we had the financial analysis we would know that it's acceptably smaller Scott do you agree with me on that yeah and and you know whether or not we can pay for it right if, you know which is obviously a huge function of it too and, so. and part of that analysis would then I'm assuming include the city upping the amount of money that we were going to work with them with on the TIF so our RDA agreement provided that we were going to put out um, 14 million dollars in bond initially and that there was an additional provision in the RDA that if the increment was sufficient that the developer could be reimbursed for up to 16 million dollars in cost so that's that tail end 2 million would be dependent upon the future increment what they are proposing to meet the gap is that the city bond for the 16 million because it's not only dependent upon what the increment is but we also have the SSA as part of the agreement as well as um, they have agreed in principle to not only have the SSA but also um, make gap payments early in the bond repayment schedule since the parking garage is being built first the parking garage isn't going to generate any 
increment. But these were part of the RDA changes that we were making, and they were very amenable to that. So just a basic uh, thing about mm -hmm. TIF is that the developer is utilizing the increment that would be created by their development to fund the development. And so in this case, uh, in, in, in a traditional case, the, the development is constructed, and then upon that increment, they can show their, um, their uh, reimbursable costs, the costs that would be reimbursable under the statute, prove up those costs, and then they, they get reimbursed off of any increment that comes. This agreement is different. This one has a significant public component, that being the building of a public parking garage to serve the city. And therefore, we were willing to um, agree to um, issuing the bond up front so long as we had a belt and suspenders. And the belt and suspenders were uh, having the SSA in place as well as um, having the insurance in place in addition to the bonding. So it's a bonded project, which means that the bond is for the full construction cost of the project so that if something happens to the developer in the meantime while this is getting built, it still gets built because are, we're payable are, on that. Are we okay talking at this depth of this? It's, a, the, it's in the RDA. Mm -hmm. in the it's in the RDA. Anybody could read this language. I, I understand that. I mean, on the agenda uh, tonight, yeah, okay. we're not going to have any action okay. on it. Take action. Okay. Okay. Laura, right. what's your recommendation? Do you think we should have both of them at the meeting on October 11th? Uh, the analysis and the change. We can't because the um, the well, financial be consultant right. said it won't right. be ready. Okay, My recommendation would be to have Dave here on the 11th. But though. is your recommendation that we move along so that we have that information as quickly as possible, or do you think we should wait until Dave Patzel makes his presentation? Is there a cost to us to get this information? It's just a time factor. You know, once, if, if the project is going to move forward, there are still uh, five months of things that need to get done before construction but can begin. But is there a cost for this, this analysis? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if, if we see they're changing plans and don't like them, it's a waste of Correct. money. Mm -hmm. That was my point. I don't mm -hmm. know. Just to clarify, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of point out that we did do this process when they came to us initially with a proposal, which was 171 units with 340 spaces. So we did have that initial, I think to Dave's point, the initial heart attack test was this is the program. And they ran their numbers originally. Then what we did, and that's similar to what we're doing now, is we said we would like this added to it, which was more parking and they ran the numbers and that was what we used once we were figuring out what we wanted then we said does it financially work because it wouldn't make sense just the same scenario if they said nope we can't do more parking or it was going to be 14 stories or whatever we could have made those value judgments right there without even going so i think that we've been following the same process that we normally do it's which is also deciding what we want then figuring out if it can pay for itself. I, it's the, the original Kane McKenna um, analysis was done in August of 2015, and we didn't sign the RDA until September of 2016. If that offers, just, sheds any light. This isn't life. the first rodeo this developer's been to. He knows how to forecast cost. <clears throat> that will be a question for the developer. I, I certainly... I'm not qualified right. to answer that. Right. And just to clarify, the closing of the funding gap, they are proposing less retail space and fewer parking spaces. Yes, and more residential units. I, my, I mean, we're, we're probably getting way off base on this for me to say this, but again, my personal opinion on this is it's going to sink and die. I, in the 22 years I've been doing this, I have never had people come to my house, knock on the door, or ring the doorbell, introduce themselves, and say, I know you're my alderman. I've driven by your house for many of years. I've never stopped to introduce myself. I've never stopped to talk to you. But I've read what's going on with this one Washington. 
I'm in favor of the project. Don't give them another dime and don't change from what the plan commission and you have already accepted in 22 years. I've had three people stop that I have never met before and knock on my door. Three out of 27,000 isn't very many. I understand that. And I've always been one that, you know, I'm here to represent my ward, but I'm also here to represent the entire city. So sometimes I'll vote against my ward if it's the right thing for the entire city. But I, and I said that, I had that opinion 30 days ago before well, anybody knocked on my door. I still have it. Hearing such strong opinion, I'm not averse to telling the financial consultant to put the brakes on and wait until after the meeting next Wednesday. I would agree with that. Could we have some sort of um, pro and con of more residential versus more commercial? That's exactly what we're working on. Okay. Because there are other areas for commercial nearby. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so mm -hmm. that would be interesting for me to understand. That is what we're preparing for that packet. Okay. Okay. Uh, the fractal sculpture was installed today. Great. <laughs> <laughs> On a lighter note, <laughs> and also I uh, today we ordered a clock for this room that will be a countdown clock that has a remote control that's with it, and um, it gives a green light during during the countdown, a yellow light at 30 seconds left, and a red light when your time has concluded. So on those nights when we have a need for um, keeping the clock to offer maximum amount of public participation. Um, Is the clock gonna be up here? Yes. So the public can see it? Yes. So it's let's not get a mirror put up there so that people here can see it without turning Sounds good. Or we're not using it for the alderman, just the public. <laughs> Only the public and the staff. The, 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 the chair that's supposed to be cutting somebody off yes. isn't right. going to know when it's time to cut somebody off right. if they can't see it. Could it have a Salvati? Ten second. App. Switch from the mic. Hey, um, I would just like to point out also that under executive sessions, um, we had A in there in case discussion of the timely building we wanted to have that in executive session versus an open session but since we had our discussion in open session we can eliminate that first executive session oh, okay. um, and that's all I have unless somebody has questions for me how are we doing on storage is that gonna be done before the mayor's uh, people come into town I talked no. to Bill about it today it won't be here before the mayor's people are in town unfortunately what is, is the, the what is the new projected date, or should we just say 2020, um, the next reunion? He said two <laughs> weeks. What did he say to you, Susan? Soon. And oh, asked, he said soon? And I asked him if that was within the next calendar year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Soon. Soon. Um, I, I believe in the next couple of weeks, the panels are at the printer. The, I thought the brackets broke. I thought the panels were done. The, yeah, the, the brackets had to be redone, but he had the brackets out here last week or the week before, and with uh, he set them in the thing and they worked. So, so he has the brackets. We just need the, the finished panels to affix to them. They didn't want and believe me, if I knew how to print panels, I'd be over there doing it myself. They didn't want to etch the panels, panels until the brackets were correct. Yes, exactly. So it was... Uh, Brackets first, panel second. Right. So that's where it is. <clears throat> well, the Golden Corral conversation has been surpassed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for others? No, that's it. Nope. I that's got good. one. Scott, 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 what, Hansford? Scott, Hansford? Oh, yes. Um, so the Hansford property um, I wanted to ask you about right now, that is a, one of the properties that Mayor had mentioned when he was talking about some unsightly properties and um, we had discussed that we've gone through um, numerous adjudications over this property um, Scott maybe you can just give the update on where things are right now sure yeah we have gone through adjudication we um, had a court order to prevent the um, would-be heirs from occupying the property because they kept bringing stuff in and not maintaining the property. So we have a court order to prevent them from actually entering the property at this time. 
um, and we are trying to figure out what our next steps are in order to do that. We do our, we are maintaining the property, we're mowing it, all the debris, all the other squatter type things have been removed from the property, the building has been boarded up. Um, but in talking with our attorney, the next step really would be to try and enter into the foreclosure action uh, to essentially get our money back for what we've spent so far on the property. I mean, we do have the property lien, so uh, before the property can be sold, we would still get our money back, but uh, this would be a way to get it back as, as fat, in a faster way as part of the foreclosure proceedings. So um, that was kind of the next step we were looking at, but we wanted to get some guidance from the council first before we did that. Um, our legal fees that we'd be looking at would be somewhere between $1,500 and $5,000, depending on how complex it gets to be. Um, we can recover those costs again because we could lien the property or have that as part of the whole proceed court proceedings here. Um, but we were looking to see if that's something that you would like to do or if you would just want to wait till the bank is done with their foreclosure process. Um, again, it's an undetermined period of time and how long that's going to take. So, is our foreclosure process likely to be any faster than what the bank's already going through? Well, no, what, what the attorneys said is that they would have us join their foreclosure process, mm -hmm. which would apparently speed up the process because we would be a, a claimant on, on the property because of our current liens. We have about $10,000 cost so far on the property. So we would have a ability to um, have a security position on, on that lien as part of that. And so that would give us some ability to collect on that. So the bank may want to move things along so that they don't perhaps lose some position or something like that, I guess. Is there a first and a second or just a first? Uh, I do believe it's just a first. Yeah, and then we're, we're a mechanics lien essentially, so we take priority over that. Do it. Do we got any time idea of what time frame we're going to see? I, you know, I don't think that these residents up in the fourth ward who are ringing my phone on a weekly basis could care less about whether we're getting our money back. They just want this property removed from the landscape. I got this one woman up there that is very upset because she can't she claims it's the reason she can't sell her house and she's got her house for sale and people come and repeatedly ask what's with this boarded up thing down the street and so there's a lot of people who are quite anguished about this up in the fourth ward at least I'm hearing. I can't say that it would officially speed it up but um, at least it would make sure that it's follow through diligently because the bank may be dragging their feet for whatever reason, who knows, but you know, we obviously have an incentive to get it done. Are we thinking six months to get this done? I, I couldn't tell you a specific time. Which, which bank is it? Uh, is it one of the big ones? I, I can't recall offhand, I'm sorry. It's like B of A, Chase. It's, it's one of the bigger banks. It's yeah. going to be 18 months before they're done. Let's just be, it's going to be 18 months. And, and that would be, I'm not sure I understand the process, that would just be where the bank would take over control of it. Yeah, that's right. And then they're going to sit on it for how long before right. they do something with it. Right. In the meantime, we're cutting the grass right. and we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Is there anything we can do as far as eminent domain on that and, right. and, and take it and tear it down ourselves? And you could. I mean, I haven't asked the attorney what the cost would be to acquire it and all that. I mean, that, but that, that is something you could do. In the long run, I think it would be less expensive to acquire it. I really do. And maintain it for a year it's or 18 gonna, months? It's going to be a year. It's going to be yeah, more, than, more it, than a year. You're going to knock it down and plant some grass and put it up for sale. Mm -hmm. It's a double lot, I it think, is. isn't it? It is. It's two lots, so you, two could, lot. you could sell them separately for two homes. Makes sense to me. I think we should pursue whatever alternative there is out there to get it in a presentable situation soonest if that's eminent domain or if that's foreclosure or, or another lien whatever it is whatever we got to do to get that thing under control fast yeah, I think what I'd maybe like to do is have the staff take some pictures of it and then bring them down here maybe to the next City Council meeting and we'll show the pictures and let you see exactly what we're talking about here <clears throat> and then let you know that would go on TV and everything let everybody know we're down here trying to do something and then we will uh, make a decision as to whether or not we should pursue with proceed with them in a domain. Okay. We can right. get the Facebook on the laptop. We can put the pictures up. I, sure. Yeah. I was going to say I, I know what it looks like. It was. I, I, I think the it was a I don't need front to see page yeah. of the Chronicle. I don't need to see another picture of it. I'm I don't think everybody here has seen it, so I just think we ought to be showing some pictures. Of it. I think Mayor's got a 
point he's trying to make here, so I just want to make it. All right, anything else? I got something. Mayor? Uh, we've got an interesting issue that's been brewing here now for about six weeks, and it starts out in the second ward on Main Street between Blair and about Batavia High School. And we got some residents out there that apparently are feeding wild animals. And we have some of the neighbors that have prepared about a 20 page book or a 25 page book in which they've got photos and all kinds of stuff showing all this activity of these people coming out and feeding these animals and it's skunks and coyotes specifically. Then we move over to the fifth ward and we're right here in downtown Batavia and I now have a there's a new budding industry in town of the trappers uh, they've really started to want to offer their services and I got a call from one the other day uh, wanting to know if we would like to hire him to uh, help us eliminate the river rain problem that we are now having where they claim that we are being invaded at night by coyotes and during the day Laura says she has seen some up there I, I went up there and have walked around I've been in all the areas I can't find where these coyotes are hanging out, but there supposedly is a, a herd of coyotes living around River Rain. I, I find this hard to believe because it's, you know, it's a pretty urbanized area down here, and for the coyotes to walk around, I guess, but they're there. Okay. But most interestingly, I've just received from the Fourth Ward a uh, letter from a gentleman that lives up in the Batavia Highlands, and he and his neighbors have taken matters into their own hands. And they have gone out and hired a trapper, and he has brought in, set up two have a heart traps, of which they are being charged $165 for. And they are also being charged $65 per animal for the animals that have been caught. And so far, they have caught three raccoons, four possums, and 13 skunks. And they now have been presented with a bill for $1,000. $465, of which they would like you folks to agree to pay. <laughs> I can tell you, Your Honor, I have a picture right here on my phone coming out of the parking lot behind the police station. That's coyotes, okay. two of them, that were down there after a council meeting a month ago. Okay. And okay. I saw one out on Randall Road, middle of the day, I think it was Saturday, trying to pick a deer off the side of the road, run back into Brayburn Marsh, and then when we came back by, it came back out again trying to drag the deer off the side of the road. So they're out there, but I don't, I don't think there's anything we can do I don't know it. necessarily what we're going to do about it. I mean, you know, you're, we're surrounded by Fermilab, 6,800 acres on the east side, which is a federal game protected preserve. Mm -hmm. And uh, the police tell me that on uh, Tuesday, or see, it's tonight, it's Tuesday and Wednesday nights, uh, the boys and girls come down the, Roar, the Chicago Roar, or the Burlington Railroad track from the east in, in herds, and they come out on State Street, I guess it's like a receiving ground, and all these coyotes come off, and what they're there for is somehow the word's been passed around out at Fermilab that tonight's the night that the garbage cans are sitting out and the bags are sitting out, and the animals are in search of these garbage, or specifically if you leave a bag there. They can't break into the city um, drums that we haul out on the street, but they go after the bags, and then they spread it all over the street and chew everything. And so now, then tomorrow, that's all south of Wilson Street tonight, and tomorrow night they'll be back on the north side, but on the west side, the group comes out in Nelson's Lake area. Now there's about 1,500 acres out there that's now part of the largest forest preserve in Kane County, and the boys and girls out there are living, and they get hungry, and so they have the same schedule as the folks on the east side, and they come in on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, and that's the night that we get overflowed with the wild animals. And so, I'm, I'm, as your mayor, I'm getting all these calls from letters, emails from folks wanting us to do something about all these animals. And now I have the trappers literally lining up at the door wanting to come in here and sell us their services. I don't, I've got five raccoons in my backyard, so if we're going <laughs> to start but paying for them. pickup, I mean, I'm... Can I get in line? I mean, it's just not reasonable. It's this yeah. nature. I'm, just, I'm sharing this with you. No, I get it. It's I, I appreciate the fact because my wife let our dogs out and didn't see that the raccoons were out there. And I've got one dog that's a little smaller. And fortunately, the raccoons all took off up the trees. But, I mean, it's 
welcome to the suburbs. I, I don't know what to say. Right. You know I mean? It's it's uh, trying to trap and relocate animals of that nature is literally playing whack-a-mole. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, it's also illegal in Illinois. I found that out after trying to relocate possums that you can't take them out and drop them off in a forest preserve or anywhere else that's public. That's illegal if you do it as a private citizen. You know what might be a good idea, and I've been approached by the uh, park district, they have um, created a, an educational program. And, and I really think that's probably where our best bang for a buck is in teaching people how to make your property less attractive. Mm -hmm. well, definitely you. don't feed them. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't put your trash out them. in plastic bags. And we looked at uh, different, thanks to Anthony, did some research for animals. us about what other municipalities, do they have ordinances against feeding animals? Couldn't find very many out there that had that ordinance because, as you can imagine, it would be an enforcement nightmare. Yeah. You know, my bird feeder also happens to feed not only three dogs who get the bird seed that's knocked on the ground, but quite a few squirrels, and I'm who knows what gets in there at night and eats the stuff from my bird feeder. Mm -hmm. Twice in the last two weeks on Tuesday nights when I've been walking home, I've encountered a small raccoon walking across the footbridge, mm -hmm. which is kind of a surprise. Well, no, these have been on the bridge, and then they disappear off the sides, and I look over to see, did they <laughs> jump, or where are they? But no, they, they've just made their way down. So well, Tuesday and Wednesday are the search and find nights of the mm -hmm. well, I, Some of that is, like Laura said, an educational program. If you put stuff out in plastic bags mm -hmm. the animals are going to come find it and they're going to tear it open if you mm -hmm. live out west where there's bears and things you <laughs> certainly i mean you, everybody knows what to do to make your house less attractive to them and tanglewood sounds like yes <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like a suggestion for our communications director to work on i was Maybe just going to say for a video about this our communications coordinator also happens to be an expert in wildlife and have a number of contacts in that community <laughs> there's an opposite side though as we all know through email there is at least one resident that would rather have the animals stay and us leave Right. Right. So what do we do with, with that? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I guess I get the consensus here is we don't want to do anything, which I'm not arguing with. I just wanted to let everybody here know that this is a hot topic, and it's on the doorstep almost daily here with somebody that's got a problem with skunks, raccoons, or coyotes. Are you coaching them when you get a phone call? Do you tell them? This is probably well, the, the last time most you're of them, leave a bag out, right? Well, the one the one on Main Street showed up and gave Laura and I this packet of information. Uh, the River Rain guys, the trappers, are wanting to get their hands on that deal, so they're calling up, wanting to. I had three now talk with me, and I think somebody at River Rain is putting the word out and stirring these guys up. And then this email just came from the Fourth Ward today or the other day about wanting to, to talk about reimbursing them. So. I'm just saying if you get any more phone calls, I would I would certainly coach them to secure their, their garbage. <laughs> well, it's beyond, they're claiming it's, you know, beyond the garbage, they still have the skunks coming in any day of the week. But the police tell me that it's, if you're riding around in the squad and I invite any of you to want to go out and do it on Tuesday or Wednesday night, they can show you all kinds of wildlife cruising the streets of yeah. Batavia. And there's this classic story about they line up coming down the railroad tracks out of the east side. They get on out at Fermilab and come right in, and that's their, that's their route into town. They have to be posting on social media what their plans are. Yeah. <laughs> they have a chat room. Hi, Noob. OK, let's go on to 12. Alders? Do we have any others? OK, good. Let's go on to executive session for the purpose of um, Let's see, we took this purchase of sale price mm -hmm. off there. So the only thing we're going to have under executive session is approval and review of the 2017 executive mm -hmm. session minutes. And there won't be anything coming out of executive session because there's nothing really to come out of executive session because of that. Would you vote on the approval of the minutes after you came out of executive session? <clears throat> it's or not on the agenda. Not on the agenda. Okay, so we'll put it on the next one. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so I need a motion. Second. 
So moved by Silvati, second by Ewer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, so we're going into executive Sorry. session and there won't be anything after.